a session of the education program. Um, this is the third. In each one, we take one heap and one knee topic, as you know. This time we have, uh, as routine, very eminent speakers uh, from the country. The first hip topic is to be covered by uh, Dr. Pradeep Punus, who is a professor of orthopedics at the prestigious CMC Vellore Institute. He is half Indian, half Australian. So I think for tomorrow's match of India Australia, it is going to be difficult for him. Very eminent should uh, vote because he is equally attached. Uh, and trained and working with the Australian University also. His uh, passion for the hip has done a lot of applications and is going to cover a very important practical topic of intraoperative landmarks for acid tabular cup placement. If you really want to be perfect, what are the landmarks you are going to use? How you will put your cup placement and do the trial reduction? What are the points you will observe? that you really get near normal um, uh, hip replacement without any problems of lip lengthening or post-operative dislocation. So very important practical tips he is going to give us, um, Dr. Professor Pradeep Punus. Um, and we are very thankful on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Dana Shekharaja, and all of the ISKS Trust, Trustee Board and Executive Committee. We thank you for spending your time and uh, uh, looking forward to your talk, uh, which will be very fruitful to all of us. The second talk is going to be with Dr. Park Sancheti. We'll introduce him. He's just going to join a little late, but I think it's uh, five minutes past seven. And with this uh, small introduction, uh, I welcome all the trustee board and managing trustees and executive board members, those who have joined here today, and all the colleagues and friends, um, those who have joined from all over the country. Um, I welcome Dr. Pradeep um, to take over and start your talk. Thank you, Dr. Dave. So I'll just um, share my screen right now. Right, so that's the screen that's being shared. Okay, I assume you can hear, you can see me now and you can hear me now. Um, so basically what I'll be talking about is in two sessions. One is about soft tissue balancing. So that involves, uh, you know, the um, soft tissue, your offset and length management. And the other part is actually your cup placement. Now, we have all done this, right? We have put the legs together to see if the length is correct. But this is actually quite an inaccurate way of measuring whether you've got it right or not. And in fact, what are you going to do once you get this? You've also seen this particular test. It's called the shuck test. Now, this is a reflection of soft tissue tension. But what are you going to do once you get this problem with soft tissue tension? Are you going to be increasing the neck length? Are you going to be keeping the neck, I mean, the stem proud? So there are a few terms that you have to learn as a postgraduate or as a beginning surgeon. And I'm going to take you through some of them. Okay, so now when you look at this particular x-ray, you I'm mean, sorry, this particular slide, what you can see is that the offset on this side is low. That is your horizontal offset. And so you need so you need to know that probably the soft tissue tension is going to be low because of what we call the horizontal offset. And that is the vertical offset, which is not a problem. When the length is not a problem, you use what is called a high offset stem. So that's your standard horizontal offset. But you can see that the high offset stem increases your soft tissues tension only laterally. It does not affect your length at all. Now, the thing is that this is available all over the country and most surgeons do not use this because they do not know of the existence of this particular stem. And I'll come to this a little later. So remember this high offset stem, just to show you what it is. So if you put the two stems together, this is uh, two different companies, but you can see that the angle is the same. The only difference is that the offset is different. One will give the high offset stem will give you much more higher soft tissue tension as you go laterally. All right. So let me try and illustrate this to you with an example. Now, what we are taught. Okay, this is another uh, term that I'm going to be introducing at this point in time. I've told you about horizontal offset of that particular patient. For example, that is your horizontal offset. And during the time of surgery, you actually measure this particular length. That is this um, uh, horizontal offset. Now, I, I submit to you that that is really not what you need to be measuring 
at the time of surgery. What you really need to measure is a soft tissue tension. So if you look at the soft tissue tension, I think my slide, just give me a minute. Yeah. So what you're looking at is that's your soft tissue, right? That's your IT band. So what you really need to recreate when you're doing a THR is your soft tissue tension, the so-called horizontal soft tissue tension, which you're going to be measuring. I submit that you, for example, now suppose you, when you're reaming, you ream and the cup goes off inside. If you are going to be using the standard offset, which you had measured at the time of surgery, you can see that your stem is definitely going to dislocate. So in this particular situation where the cup has gone off medially, if you want to maintain that soft tissue tension, you have to use a stem with a higher offset. So your aim during surgery is not to reproduce the patient's own horizontal offset to the femur, but it is to maintain that soft tissue tension, the horizontal soft tissue tension. And for that, you need a high offset stem, not the standard offset. So during surgery, your aim is to reproduce the soft tissue horizontal tension, not the patient's own bony horizontal tension. And I'm going to come to this later. I'll come to the when we are doing the per operative assessment. Now, the next term I'm going to introduce to you, people are quite confused about what exactly is next length. You've got different things. You've got minus three, zero, and plus three, or, you know, 1.3, 5, and eight. And these are the examples. And what we can see is there's an increase in length as you increase your neck length. But which way is the length going up? It is going up at 45 degrees, which means that when you increase the neck length, you're going to be increasing your soft tissue tension laterally, as well as increasing your length. So don't forget, increasing your neck length will increase both the offset and the length. And this has practical, uh, re I mean, pra practical importance. And I'll come to this later. Now, the next concept which I'm going to talk about is sinking of the stem. Now, you can see that in the right side, I've sunk the stem in a little bit more. And because of that, you can see that the vertical offset has come. So if you have got a length problem, you can sink the stem in or you can keep it proud. But remember one thing, can you look and see what's happened to the offset? Can you see that when you sunk the stem in, your offset has also actually come down? Why did that happen? Because you can see that this is actually at a curve. This is not a straight stem. So when you sink it in, your offset, your horizontal offset, all soft tissue offset also comes down in addition to your length. Most of it is your length adjustment, but there will be a little bit of horizontal soft tissue tension also that goes down. The only way by which you can adjust only the length is a stem where the, it's almost vertical. In this kind of situation, sinking it will only affect your length, not your horizontal offset. So remember the different terms that I've used. I've used a high offset stem, which will affect only your lateral offset. I've used term neck length, which will affect both your horizontal as well as your vertical offsets. And then I've talked to you about sinking in the stem, which affects mainly the vertical offset, but it can also affect your horizontal offset a little bit. So now we're going to go on to some practical measures. How do you know what is it that is gone? Is it, you know, your horizontal offset or is it your vertical offset? And I'm going to teach this to you through the principle of a caliper. Okay, it's a removable caliper. I'll try and explain this to you through this particular uh, example. So that's the head end of the foot end. And you can see that uh, this is what the caliper looks like. There's a post and this post is actually banged or rather hit into the pelvis, onto the bony pelvis. So you have a solid bony point Then you have a side arm, which is left there. And then you have a vertical arm, which can go up and down and a clamp, which you can clamp it on. Now, this is a video here, which shows how it's used. So this is going into the pelvis. So this is going into the bony pelvis above the acetabulum. All right, so that has gone into the acetabulum. You can see that's a head end, and the other end is a, the right other end of the screen is your foot end. So what you do is before you dislocate the hip, you want to measure what the soft tissue tension is. The soft tissue tension is uh, measured by you sort of mark a point on the trochanter. So that's on the highest point of the trochanter, you mark that point. Then you take your caliper and you put it onto the post and you move that vertical screen up and down right? And you clamp it in such a position such that that arrow points against that point on the GT. So that's how you've done it. So you put it against that point and that is your reflection of your length and your offset before you have dislocated. Pre. And you can see that I actually drawn a line to maintain the collinearity. Let me show it to you again on this model. So what I've basically done is I put the post 
into the acetabulum and then I made a mark on the trochanter. All right. So now this particular length, the horizontal length from, you know, the head end to the foot end, that part of that particular caliper reflects the length or preoperative length. Pre and this, this, the distance from the, the, distance from from the, the, the femur is a reflection of your soft tissue horizontal offset. Now, let me again explain this to you. Now, after the surgery, you go ahead and you put in your implant. So your implant is in and you can see that this point is again exactly at the same point, which means that after the surgery, after you put the implant, you maintain the length and you have maintained the offset like what it was before the surgery. So you have not increased your soft tissue tension. You have not increased your length. That is ideal. So let's, this is again so looking at the video. You put the head back, you're taking the same caliper and you're putting it on the post and you can see See that point is pointing exactly again at that same point on the trochanter which you marked, which means that you reproduce the soft tissue tension like it was before. You reproduce the horizontal offset and you reproduce the length. So you're fine. Now, suppose on the preoperative x-ray, you had a one centimeter shortening. So that means after the surgery, you need to get a one centimeter lengthening. So this is your preoperative point. You put your mark there and you can see that after the end of the surgery, when you put your implant, what's happened? The mark has gone down by one centimeter, which means you've lengthened them by one centimeter, which is exactly what you wanted. So that's fantastic. I'll give you another scenario, right? You put your mark, everything there, like before the surgery, you maintain your soft tissue tension. That after the surgery, you put it in. Accidentally, I reamed a little bit more and my whole cup went inside. So what has happened? Can you see the point is not meeting up with the trochanter mark on the trochanter? So what has happened now? My length is not a problem. My length is perfectly fine, but my offset has come down. So how do I tackle this problem? If I want to increase only the offset, but not the length, I have to use what's the high offset stem. So the way you should sort the soft tissue problem out is by using a high offset stem. Here's another scenario. So can you see where the mark is? So you can see that the length has shortened, the offset has shortened, both have come down. So if both have come down, there's no point using a high offset. Here, this is where you have to increase your neck length, right? So here, if you increase your neck length, you'll increase both your offset and your length. Both can be restored. So therefore, when you see a problem with a soft tissue tension, you have to decide, is this an offset problem? In which case, I use a high offset stem. Or is it both? Then in which case, I increase the neck length. You should not use the neck length if it's only an offset problem. If it's a height problem, then you can probably sink in the stem. Now, you also have a variation of this, which is the stitch method. So you can see that, you know, it's stitched out there on the top. So it's not like a fixed point. So some people don't like putting it on the skin. So what they do instead is they put the stitch on that post, right? And you can see that in this particular uh, picture, you can see the mark is still not reached the original mark, So which means that the limb is still short. Now, this gives you an idea of length, but does not give you an idea of the offset. Okay, so it is an indirect measure, but it's not, I mean, it gives you an idea of whether your length is correct, but it does not tell you whether your offset is correct or not. So you've got different other methods like your cotyloid method, your navigation and various other things, but I'm not going to go into these. All right, so this is your soft tissue tension part. You see what is the problem and identify and sort that problem out. What I'm going to do next is to talk about the cup placement and the cup version. And before I do that, I'm just going to you are going to assess the stability, all right? So when you are going through the posterior approach, you will flex the hip to 90, and then you, you will internally rotate to see whether it is posteriorly dislocating, because that's the position in which it normally dislocates. So normally, you would internally rotate to how much? 30 degrees, 60 degrees? Well, there's no real consensus, but if you're using a large head, you do not want it dislocating till 60 degrees. In fact, some people say even 65 degrees. So 30 degrees is a little dicey, but 60 degrees is what you should really aim for. This variation of that, sorry, I think again it's stuck. Just give me a minute. Yeah, sorry. So the variation of that is a sleep position. Basically, what you're doing is you're flexing it to 90 and you're internally rotating it to 30. Again, it should be stable in this position. These are the two main tests for stability for posterior surgeons. For anterior surgeons, those who go anterolaterally, you put it in full extension and externally rotate. If it dislocates, it's unstable. The other test which you do is your figure of four. 
Now, these last two ones are for those who go through the anterolateral approach because here you're taking for anterior stability. The previous ones are for the posterior surgeons. Okay, so that's what you aim for. But what do you do when you have a problem? You now you're seeing you've got a problem. The whole thing is coming out. What should you do? And that's what we really need to talk about today. Of course, you're going to check for bony impingement and things like that. But the two other main things that you want to look for is, is there a problem with soft tissue tension? And we have discussed that, your shock test and your uh, you know offset and other things. The other most common problems, either a cup problem or a stem positioning problem. And that's what we're going to be discussing. So first, we'll talk about the cup, the concept about inclination, version, and various, and I'll try to sort of introduce you to the functional position of the cup. Now, I know you guys have all, you know, know about the safe zone, so-called safe zone, but that has really been put aside. And uh, I'll talk about, you know, why it's put aside a little later. But what we generally aim for at the time of surgery is for an angle between 35 to 45, a little narrow lane. But you want to realize that if you're doing the patient in a lateral position, remember, the leg is going to be put downwards and the pelvis are actually tilting like this when the patient is lateral. Mm -hmm. So you do not want to aim at actually 45. You actually want to aim at about 40 degrees. Because when the patient becomes straight, when he stands up, the tilt goes away and that 40 becomes 45. So my what we normally say is that you should aim for an angle of about 45, sorry, 40, so that it becomes 45 when the tilt comes back to normal. In fact, you can use an inclinometer if you want with your iPhone and by which you can sort of see and make sure that your angle is what you want at 40 degrees. Because if it's too vertical, you'll get, you know, wear on the top and dislocations. If it's too horizontal, you can again get uh, impingement on the top. Your trochanter can go and impinge and you can get inferior dislocation, which again, you don't want. So that is inclination. The second concept is version. And version is a measurement which you take on an axial cut. So you can see I marked out the antiversion. The normal antiversion is about 20 degrees or so. So when you put in the cup, you want to keep it like this antiverted. You don't want to go and put it at zero degrees version. That is not for a stable cup. You want to reproduce the patient's antiversion, which is about 20 degrees of antiversion. That is antiversion. So how do you do it? You position the patient properly. That is zero degrees. And you can, you know, Anti-word is by about 15 degrees, 20 degrees, and you'll get your correct version. So it's important to position the patient body properly. In fact, the surgeon himself should do it. Make sure that the post is in the front and the back. And so as to prevent rotation of the body, you would also want to protect it in the front and in the back on the top as well. Only then will your uh, body be stable. And then you can put in your limb about 15 degrees. Now you'll hear surgeons and you know teachers telling you that this is not an accurate method. Don't use this. Don't use this. But uh, yes, that's very true. But very often all of us do fall back on this particular positioning. So which is why positioning is very, very important. Now, what you've all been taught about is a TAL, and that's what the TAL is. It's basically the transverse vestibular ligament at the bottom, you know, where you put your normal inferior retractor. That's where the TAL is. I'm sure most of you have seen this TAL as a white structure there. You have to, when you ream, when you place your cup, you want to keep it parallel to the TAL. You want to keep it in the same position as a TAL. For example, see here, you can see that this cup is positioned parallel to the TAL. Whereas here, look, the cup is facing anterior anterior with respect to the tail so this is not on the normal position this is antiverted you don't want it antiverted the normal cup itself yes i agree is 15 to 20 degrees antiversion but if it's more than that it's too antiverted so here you can see it's pointing backwards which means that may maybe zero degrees version but this is not good for the patient so this is retroverted with respect to the tail and this is not what you want what you want is parallel to the tail so this is how you want to aim to keep your cup now, what about your bony landmarks? See, here you got the rim there. Can I sort of use that bony landmarks as a guide for putting my cup? I expect, you know, at 40 percent and things like that. Well, the fact is that the there are a lot of osteophytes, the shape of these, um, you know, the acetabulum is so varied and relying on the rim has been shown to be a bit quite an unreliable um method but you have to use various things bits and bits of everything for example now if you have an acetabular fracture like this and you want to go ahead and put in a cup your rim is gone your tile is gone so finally you may have to rely a lot on the actual positioning of the patient so use a combination of the rim the acetal 
and the positioning, but rely mostly on the tail because that's been found to be the most sensitive. I'm going to talk a little bit of a femoral antiversion because that's also important. See, when you want a stable hip, you have to get your femoral antiversion at about 15 degrees, right? So when you ream like this, you basically want to see at what position you're going to be reaming, how are you going to be putting your stem. So when you put in, see, this is a patient from the posterior approach. So I bent the knee to 90 degrees and that's the limb there. This is taken from a picture from the net. So you can see that here, you do not want to keep your stem at 90 degrees to that calf, to the uh, leg, because that will give you a zero degrees version. What you want is actually 15 degrees of anti-version. So you want to keep it 15 degrees anti. That's the kind of position you want to keep your stem in. So, in fact, I'm going to introduce you, you to a new term. Is facing forward, your acetabulum is in 20 degrees of antiversion. Your femur is in 15 degrees of antiversion. In this position, your hip is stable. In fact, this is what we need to aim for. So where you get a combined antiversion of 20 plus 15, and that's what you really need to aim for. So in fact, it's if you actually now internally rotate the leg by 15, which is a femur, and then you rotate it by another 20, what you actually see is that the head becomes parallel to the acetabulum. So when you rotate it by 35 degrees, you get your head parallel to the acetabulum. So if you want to know what the combined antiversion of this particular patient is, all you really need to do is internally rotate that limb. Internally rotate that limb. How much? Internally rotate it till your head becomes parallel to your acetabulum. And you see how much you had to internally rotate it. If you had to internally rotate 35, then your combined antiversion is 35. So that's how you measure if, it, if the, the combination, if you have to internally rotate to 55 degrees to get it parallel, that means you have got a 55 degrees combined antiversion, which is actually not very good. So I'll repeat again, you internally rotate the hip till the femoral head becomes parallel to your acetabular liner. And that's, and the, how much you internally rotate is your combined antiversion. So if you, you need a combined antiversion of approximately about 35. So that's what you need to aim for. Now, when you are actually doing your surgery, for example, here, it's coming out, right? So then you check and you internally rotate and you check your uh, combined antiversion and it's very high, something like 55. So what do I do now? What you need to do, you have to either change the version in the femur or in the cup. So you go ahead and look at your femur. Have I put it in the correct position or not? Now, if it's not put in the correct position, if it's something like 25, 30 degrees of femoral antiversion, you know you need to correct it. But this is an uncemented stem. How much can you do it? So this is where you have to think about using other stems like SROM, which can you can modulate it to the correct one or with a cemented stem. Mind you, with the stem, you can you know, change the version probably both 5 degrees, maximum maybe 10 degrees. More than that, you're not going to really be able to do. With an uncemented stem, it's almost next to impossible to change the version. In the cup, suppose you put the cup wrong, then you might just have to redo the cup. And in an uncemented cup, that becomes a problem. So you may have to go even and do a cemented cup. But better to avoid all this, why don't you just use a trial cup and then see what the position is, then you can go ahead and see. Or better still, especially in navigation and other things, what most people do is they do the femur first, then you know what the femoral antiversion is. Then using the combined antiversion, you know how much your acetabulum should be. So go ahead and put the acetabulum in the correct position. If you still have a problem, then you have to either redo the cup or put in a cement. So basically, <clears throat> when people have used this concept of combined antiversion, Rather than going for the fixed, you know, 20, 15 or whatever they thought is the uh, patient's own um, version, you find that the number of dislocations are much less by carefully looking at what kind of version you're putting both your stem and your cup. Now, I'm going to introduce you to the most, a little bit of a confusing part. This is the last section of my presentation, which is called the functional positioning of the cup. What is this functional positioning? This is um, a new concept that Larry Dore actually sort of elaborated on. Now, in your shoulder, you all know that your know, shoulder movement is not only in your glenohumeral joint. You have your scapulothoracic movement also. So your scapulothoracic, if your scapulothoracic movement is affected, your glenohumeral joint, you will not be able to abduct your shoulder well. Your shoulder movement is going to be affected. Similarly, in the spine, your spine is not only the hip. Sorry, uh, your um, hip joint is not movement only in the hip joint. It is both movement in the lumbosacral as well as in the pelvis and in the hip joint. So it is a combination of this uh, spinal movement and your hip movement, which is responsible for your hip movement. So let me try and elaborate. Sorry, I think I was a little confusing there. But when you sit, when you sit, what you are, when you 
that the inclination and the version is changing. And why is it changing? Is because the pelvis is also tilting. And in fact, what they've shown is that every 10 degrees of pelvic tilt, your version is going to significantly change. And so is your inclination. And if you put your cup in the wrong position, <clears throat> or if your spine is not going to be mobile, there's a much uh, higher chance of dislocation. So let me show you this. Now, this particular patient is trying to sit. And what you can see is that, look at the, what's happening in the lumbosacral spine. As he's sitting, can you see that the sacral slope is actually coming down? Now, you look at what's happening when he's standing. Sacral slope is actually wide open and it becomes closer when he's sitting. So, in fact, if I show you static images, that's a guy sitting, sorry, standing. And you can see the sacral slope is quite large. It's probably more than 30. But when he starts sitting, the sacral slope decreases. This is in general, not everybody, in general. And it's usually less than 30. Now, I'm going to give you a different scenario. So for example, in a kyphotic spine. Okay, in a kyphotic spine, what happens is, Normally, the sacral slope is very low. You can see the way the guy is standing. The sacral slope is low when he's sitting. But what happens is when he stands, it is still less than 30. Normally, you would have expected to go than 30, but it's stuck in that sitting position, which means that the spine is not really moving. All the movement is only occurring at the hip after you do a THR. Nothing is occurring at the As the patient is trying to stand, what happens is the hip is, the spine is not moving. Pelvis is not moving. So as it's trying to stand, as the hip is trying to extend, it's going to impinge. It's going to impinge posteriorly and it's going to dislocate the anterior. And that's not what you want. So if it's going to have a tendency to that, you have to probably reduce the antiversion to try and prevent that anterior dislocation. I'm going to give you another scenario so, so that you can try and understand this again. This is what you normally see in revision situations. In revision situations, what happens is, when he's standing, yes, the uh, sacral slope is always high. It's more than 30. But when he sits, normally you'd expect it to go less than 30. But here, when he sits also, it's like it's greater than 30, which means it's almost like it's stuck in standing in both the sitting position and in the standing position. So the sacral slope is still very high. So what happens is when he is trying to sit, just look again. When he's trying to sit, the spine is not moving. Hip is moving, the hip impinges anteriorly and it will just dislocate posteriorly. That's because the spine is not moving as much as it should. So you have different situations. If you didn't understand what, everything I said, just remember this. In a kyphotic spine like an ankylosing spondylitis, there's a tendency to dislocate anteriorly. So you need to a cup, which means that don't put the cup parallel to the talon. Reduce the antiversion with respect to the talon. You can see this is what is meant by functional um, um, version. Meaning in the sense, functional position, you're not going by the tail, you're going by a combination of the lumbosacral spine movement and the patient's movement. In a revision situation, what's happened, it's stuck like in a standing position. And so there's a tendency to dislocate posteriorly. And in this situation, if you want to prevent the dislocation posteriorly, you have to increase the antiversion so that it does not dislocate. So don't keep it parallel to the tail, increase the antiversion. So which is why... In all patients, it is very important to look and see the standing and the sitting x-rays and measure the sacral slope and other angles. Because the version of the cup should not be always parallel to the talon. It may be antiverted, it may be retroverted to the talon. The inclination may need to decrease or may need to decrease depending on that patient. And every patient, believe me, is different. So you've got a whole lot of new terms now being described. Standing, stuck, standing, stuck, sitting, you know, hypermobile, stiff spine. And the combined antiversion is now replaced by something called the combined satchel index. This is a little confusing. It's all a little bit new. So I'm just giving you the reference here. You can look at this. You can look also look at Larry Doe's original paper. It's about a functional safe component positioning. And this is based on the lumbosacral spine slope measurements. There's another paper, a nice one by Rajesh Malhotra et al., I think that's also another one which you can easily access from the Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma. So the key thing, I'm not going to go into this. There can be differences in the sagittal plane also. But I think the key thing what I wanted to measure, talk to you about was the fact that for all patients, it's important to assess the spine as well as the hip. And it's very important that for all patients, we take the lumbosacral spine x-rays both in standing and in sitting. I'll stop here. Um... And uh, I'll hand it over to the uh, moderators for any questions or anything else that needs to come up.
Yes, uh, uh, Pradeep, there are a couple of questions you can also see. Can you? There are two um, questions there. Sure, I'll just have a quick look. Okay. So, you just on your uh, video, Pradeep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Vikram. So, I mean, if any of the other faculty also have anything to sort of say for any of those questions, please uh, sort of, uh, uh, please pitch in. So, uh, the first question was, um, in most cases of advanced arthritis, the head will be destroyed, collapsed, and the disease is often bilateral. How do we measure balance offset to soft tissue tension in such cases? Absolutely, you should always do the templating, preoperative templating on the side of the arthritic hip. You do not do it on the non-arthritic hip. And when you have bilateral, obviously, it's a little bit of a guessometer as to how much you need to correct. If you feel that the head is significantly destroyed, then you, looking at the preoperative x-ray, you'll have a rough idea of how much length is lost and how much um, offset is lost if it's a bilateral involved case. If it's only unilateral, you can always compare it to the opposite side. But when it's bilaterally involved, it is a bit of a guess meter as to how much of destruction there is in the head, both in the horizontal offset and in the vertical offset. And that you need to correct per, per operatively. Do any of the other faculty have anything else to comment on that particular question before we go to the rest? Dr. Pachore. Yeah, no, I will uh, get a little bit after. Do you continue or Continue our questions. Question okay. Answer. Right. Um, so the next question. Well, next question was: uh, Does the starting point of canal while reaming in the femur dictate the version? What is the best starting position? Uh, this is actually something that I didn't touch upon. It may not affect the version very much, but it definitely affects whether your um, stem is going into varus or into valgus is that you should go as laterally as possible near the pyriform quiz fossa and then you put your canal finder and you put your canal finder as laterally as possible and in fact some people you, you use a brooch and a ream to make sure that you take off the lateral hard cortical bone because it's a tendency for the lateral bone to push the stem off medially and then the whole you know the femur becomes varice which is what you do not want so start the entry point as laterally as possible the other thing is that you know there are some landmarks so the landmark that i or the guy that i told you about for femoral antiversion is that you keep in when going through the posterior approach you keep the uh flex the knee to 90 degrees and you look at where your leg is and that is the 90 degree position and then based on that you can give it another 15 degrees of antiversion that's one technique some people go by parallel to the posterior border when you're doing a of the of the neck when you're doing uh, the position. Others, what they do is, see, this is after all the axial section of your neck. So if you take a V around the base of the neck and you bisect the neck and you put it towards the pyriform fossa, so the line joining the pyriform fossa to the bisecting of the femoral neck, that is again something that can dictate what your version is. So the position where you start reaming, that will affect your varus valgus position for the diaphragm your brooch determines your femoral version. So the question was, the next question was how to adjust the version in patients with an increased pelvic tilt. See, yes, you're, this is a very good question. See, remember in a normal person or you know, in most people, when the pelvis tilts posteriorly, your version and your inclination will go up. So like your, your, um, uh, the same kind, when you're looking at lumbosacral uh, angles, you will be making a decision as to whether this pelvis is stuck in the sitting position or the standing position, and you'll be adjusting your version. The same changes that you make in your version, you should make in your inclination, which means that if you're decreasing your anti-version, you should be decreasing your inclination also. But remember, pelvic tilt affects the version much more than the inclination. What I told you, the 10 degrees of pelvic tilt will affect 7 degrees of version but only about three degrees of inclination. So it affects the version much more than the inclination. But yes, you do need to make changes in both. Mm. There is another question on coxa vara and coxa valga. I think somebody has asked. Yeah. So there again, oh. I actually did not uh, cover that in this talk. But, uh, you know, there are companies which actually give you uh, coxa vara stems. 
which basically the normal angle in your normal artificial stems is about 135 degrees, some may be 130, 132 degrees, but you also have stems which have got a neck angle of 125 degrees. So you can ask for the coxa vara stem. The other way is that you need to cut your stem, your neck cut can be made differently. So you can sink in or make, keep it more prouder depending on whether it's coxa vara or coxa valga. So generally for a coxa valga, we keep it proud so that the vertical offset is increased, but horizontal offset is not increased. For a coxa vara, you sink it down so that your vertical offset not not increased. It is kept low. So these are two differences in a cut. So remember what we said is that when you sink the stem in, your vertical offset comes down, which is what you have in coxa vara. If you keep your stem proud, you'll have an increased vertical offset, which is what you get in coxa valga. So just remember it that way. If you want your neck up, if you want your uh, coxa valga high, you want your central rotation high, you obviously keep your neck out much more prouder. Whereas if you want it down, you sink it a little bit more. But, you know, for coxa, special stems, which you can ask for. Okay, there's, next, shall I go on to the next question? The next question is, uh, in unilateral cases, if there's a shortening of one centimeter, then should we restore it while measuring vertical offset with trial? See, usually, it is short. why is it shortened by one centimeter? It is shortened by one centimeter usually because of your destruction of your head in our normal arthritis. So when you restore your normal head, then your shortening will also correct automatically. So usually you don't have to do anything special to correct that shortening because in most situations, it is because the femur, femoral head has been destroyed and that's why you're getting a one centimeter shortening. So if you just go through your normal parameters of how you do it, you'll normally will get your shortening also corrected. And how do we uh, correct it? How do we measure whether we're corrected? You can use the scalper method and you can make sure that you have got corrected your length during the trial. So you do measure it at the trial, trial, trial to see whether you're corrected or not. And if you haven't, then you adjust your stem position to make sure that you get your um, your vertical offset corrected. If it's both vertical and horizontal offset that is reduced, then you use a longer neck length. So and in case of unilateral... Uh, Dr. Pradeep, in case yeah. of unilateral hips, you have the opposite hip to template. So try to reproduce the oppo opposite hip offset and uh, neck length. So that's what uh, one more yeah. option. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'll put it this way. See, or do most of your templating on the affected side itself. But when you do your limb length measurement, you are obviously comparing it with something. So you're comparing that limb length measurement with the opposite side. So in fact, preoperatively, I showed you in that x-ray, you draw the line, the teardrops line, you draw the line between the trochanter and find out how much of shortening there is and how much of lengthening you need to do at the time of surgery. So before you dislocate the hip, you mark that trochanter and you see what is the present length and present offset. After the surgery, you know, because of your preoperative templating, that I want a one centimeter lengthening. So put your after you put your implant, you again use your uh, you know that caliper, and you see have I got that one centimeter back or not? If I haven't, I need to do something, and I've told you the methods by which you can increase it by one centimeter, either keeping the length proud, I mean the stem proud, or increasing your offset. Usually, when you correct your femoral head shape, the length comes back. The very little that you have to do. So the last question is in dysplastic hips, in in which there is an increased neck antiversion. Which neck version should be kept and combined anti version? So when you're doing a dysplastic hip, say even like a close four, where you know, as you rightly pointed out, you your femoral anti version is something like 30, and you cannot obviously keep that. What do you need for a stable hip? You need a combined anti version of 30. So when you're doing your dysplastic, your acetabular cup normally at about 15 or 20 degrees anti version. So if you want to combine anti-version of 35, how much you put, should you put your femur? So your femur should also be at 15. So you use an SROM, do whatever you have, because you cannot keep it at 35. You cannot keep it at the patient's own version. So you use an SROM and use the SROM, keep it in prone position, keep the leg and keep it that uh, femur at 15 degrees anti-version. So your combined anti-version is 15 plus 20, 35. Fantastic. You'll get a stable. Okay. So you don't go by the patient's own stem in this kind of situation. You have to determine what your combined antiversion is, and you need to put that in there. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we can have a uh, few comments from Dr. Pachore because it's almost uh, uh, 7.45. Uh, uh, has Parag joined? Parag, are you on? Hello. Can we hear? 
Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Has Parag Hello. joined? Parag Sanjay? Okay. Not yet, doctor. Is he on? Not yet, doctor. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Parag, you are here. Fine. No, no. Okay. Fine. Um, Dr. Pachore, uh, just need some comments from you. And at this <laughs> stage, I welcome, uh, I see Dr. Vikram Shah, our managing trustee of East. He has joined from US. So uh, this is just to uh, tell the all young surgeons that uh, every senior guy, uh, the, the trustees, the managing trustee, the executive board members, all of them are joining to, to hear, to listen, to learn. So it's a learning process, it's a continuous process. Please tell your friends, very senior guys, very experienced people are spending time to give you this talk free of charge. Please tell your colleagues to join. The next lecture is going to be on 4th of November. Again, we will circulate the, the name and the topics of the hip and knee surgeons. Before that, uh, I will just request Dr. Pachore to have some comment. And I take this opportunity to thanks Dr. Pradeep on behalf of myself, Dr. Raja, and our executive board of the is for sparing this time and giving us a wonderful talk. Uh, Dr. Pachore. <laughs> uh, thank Pradeep. It was an excellent lecture. I learned a couple of things. <laughs> but as a, just a little bit of experience and few important technical points are. The regarding offset, you mentioned quite a lot. One study uh, we must respect is from uh, Rotak that the, our Indian offsets are by and large 90 to 95 percent of our patients have offset between 35 and 40. We have a very small percentage of using a high offset stems. That is one, one important finding. And every surgeon should know, I agree with you, every surgeon should know that there is a high offset available and they are available with two or three companies, not all of them. Uh, the another important thing was limb length. Yes, you mentioned quite a lot on the calipers and other things. One important point was when you measure any limb length, you should know preoperative where your limb was, whether it is adduction, abduction or flexion. And exactly you should measure in the same because the slight change will take a long, almost about 5 to 7 millimeters you are away. And that's a very important finding uh, from the from all, all the measurements you do, whether the stitch method or caliper or runover. Runover run is very close to the deformity and to the center of rotation. That's why most people like to use that method use that method method and regarding very good uh, concept of combined antibiotics you made and uh, i learned actually i do the femur and our unit also does the femur first and then we can adjust but you can't do a mismatch suppose you have an antiversion on one side is too much and then other you can't do that you can't do that uh, but still you have got about five degrees of ten degrees of play you can't do more than that Uncemented stem, I totally agree. You can't ch change the version more than five to seven degrees. Uh, seven degrees, then you'll have to use the SROM, which is available. Available and uh, option of bailout is a uh, cemented stems. Cemented stems. Regarding the reaming, one thing I learned from London Clinic, uh, London Clinic, uh, from uh, Sarah, that uh, how do you ream this ant antiversion? I learned a technique. Your tail is there. You mark uh, on the drape. They exactly parallel to the tail. One mark marker is there, and then you right angle to that mark because you once you put a uh, uh, the uh, reamer, you don't know where is the tail. So you have a uh, option of marking in the front, and then you exactly do a ninety degrees to ninety degrees. That you will be you will be quite uh, important important point of this, and I think you will uh, pointed out the uh, the. The mark, uh, bony marks, I think that is another one thing which is Rana would describe very well that the posterior lateral corner should be exposed about two to three millimeter. That means most of the time, more than 95 percent, you are the your version and uh, inclination is quite good as far as this is that was concerned. Regarding the uh, spine, pelvic pain, I think a lot of things are coming up, uh, coming up. I still we are not very crystallized, crystallized. Uh, but I think uh, there is no question that we have to look into this. If you look at our data from our own country, even in ankylosing spondylitis, it is a stiff spine. The whole variety is of deformity, but the rate of dislocation is very low. And we must thank uh, the AIMS, uh, Surya Ban and as well as Rajesh Balotra to point out this is the first paper of the world that you have an anterior dislocation in the ankylosing spondylitis in spite of using a posterior approach. And that was a kyphotic spine. I think that is the one thing you pointed out very well that you reduce your antiversion. But 
one important message is if your spinal uh, uh, pelvic and uh, spinal movements are uh, free i think you do just like a normal what you want to do it a uh, uh, normal antiversion of the cup uh, important is the mobile uh, mobil- mobility at the pel- uh, sacral uh, sacral junction that is imp- that is important i think made it very very clear i think uh, i i think there are a couple of points were there i think that's okay uh, the, but uh, you did a, a wonderful job and i'm very thankful to you on behalf of our trustees and our members very very great uh, lecture thanks pradeep thank you sir thank you yes um thank you pradeep um and um, we look forward to see you in the second round okay sure fine so our next speaker is uh, dr parak sancheti um he is from the very famous sancheti institutes of postgraduate and medical research center from pune um parag is involved in a lot of research activities academic activities designing part and uh, uh, he does not need any introduction um he has agreed uh, to be here as a panelist and give a talk on a very common problem but uh, uh, the varus deformity the bone <coughs> defect the management of the severe varus and how you do which is the very common day to day problem which all of us face so on behalf of uh, uh, our ed- education committee and our trustee board members and the managing trustee i welcome parag sancheti uh, to give his talk parag thank you thank you very much sir on the outset i am really obliged to the ish executive board for considering my name and today i feel extra lucky that two of my mentors are here who are listening to my talk kachore sir and uh, vikram bhai so it's really nice to see both of them here and uh, i have to be i'm a little nervous now to give the talk because yep. you know they are going to pick up my mistakes yeah. but i am happy as i, I said will... parag vikram has joined from us he is sitting in us at the moment you yeah. know thank yeah. you thank you vikram bhai much appreciated so <clears throat> without any further ado we will start as uh, deepak sir has said this is a very common topic and you know 90% of our cases is what we uh, deal with is the virus with some amount of bone defects and you know that is what we see all the time i hope you are able to see my screen yes so perfect so we will start off with this common topic whenever you are dealing with a severe varus deformity i think what is important for us to understand is first decide you know what is the extent of the deformity how much is the deformity correctable how much is it fixed and how much is the bone defect so i will you know stress on all these points uh, as uh, we go ahead with the talk approximately how much time uh, the way sir i have Oh, you are muted, the but talk, the, the talk the, the talk is for about twenty to twenty five minutes, and okay, then twenty minutes, minutes and then we take questions. Perfect, sounds good. So this is what we have to understand, and this is a lot of preoperative planning. Uh, on the outset, let me say I am a surgeon who is a mechanical alignment surgeon. I still don't believe in doing kinematic. I am still ninety percent non robotic. but of course pune being a robotic capital we do have a robotic at uh, sancheti hospital and occasionally uh, i am uh, using it but essentially uh, i am non robotic mechanically aligned and that is what i believe in and that is what uh, my talk will be biased to if i may use that word so how do we know whether the deformity is correctable or not so the important is the valgus stress view x ray so whenever you take that x ray what is important for you to understand is you have to give the stress you can see the varus deformity that is a single joint weight bearing the deformity if it is not fixed will get exaggerated and when you give the valgus stress x ray you will see that the deformity is correcting and here it is from 35 degrees correcting to 5 degrees exposing the bone defect which is seen and at the same time showing us that this case is not going to require much release in fact it is going to require <clears throat> more of the bone defect management so that is something uh, which is very important versus this patient look at this you know we are trying to give a valgus stress the deformity is not correcting 
and this is where a lot of release is going to be required and uh, <clears throat> we have to be planned, planning for that. We all know the media structures which get contracted uh, in the virus deformity and nowadays with more and more of practice I am releasing less and less but of course soft tissue release is still the forte in correcting the virus deformities. The kinematically aligned guys may say that you know much soft tissue release is not required and they would go by more bony correction but still you have to be aware that the deep MCL, the posterior medial capsule, the semimembranosis, the PES and of course the superficial MCL uh, is uh, also contracted. One thing I let me tell you up front is that the superficial MCL is one structure which you should release at the last. Keep that as <clears throat> the last because if sometimes you over release the MCL then that's a problem you may blow it out you may suddenly you know get that oops movement when you're finding that the medial joint is tight tight you release the superficial MCL and you know sometimes it opens up too much that is the time you know that you have over released so be very careful and even if uh, you don't release the superficial MCL you can still balance the knee very well you know some tips on fixed virus whenever there is a fixed virus especially in flexion then the tightness is more of the middle and the anterior part of the deep MCL so release that and persistent virus also present in extension then the tightness is more of the posterior portion of deep MCL and sometimes a superficial MCL and these rare cases then I would uh, probably release the superficial MCL. Medial structures which get released this is one tip I want to give you this is a technique uh, which we use routinely what happens in severe virus deformities when you do the soft tissue release the medial sleeve can get retracted posteriorly at the end of your procedure and you are not able to get a watertight closure. So what I do is I just put two stitches with Vicryl number one and then you know we pull those stitches to come more uh, anteriorly and keep tagging on them so that the end of the procedure when you've done a lot of release then your stitches are there to hold the posterior medial capsule and the medial structures which will help you to get a good closure. So that is one of the tips I wish to give uh, the new uh, newcomers and who are just starting to do knee replacement. Then of course my principle is I follow the Ranawat principle. I do the balancing in extension by medial release and the balancing in flexion is more done by the rotation of the femoral component. Whenever we are doing the medial release and balancing in <coughs> extension, please keep in mind that also the medial structures from the femoral side can cause the virus deformity. As in this case, you can see there is a big osteophyte on the present, big osteophyte present on the medial surface uh, of the medial condyle of the femur. And then you've got to release this by retracting the MCL. So that retractor is holding the MCL. Otherwise, you know, you may damage the MCL while removing the medial osteophyte from the medial condyle. This is in routine deformities. Whenever you are dealing with severe virus deformities, keep in mind three additional releases which you might have to do. The first is the posterior medial structure release, then is the pie crusting of the MCL and the last which I have mentioned to you is the release of the superficial MCL. Now how do you do the posterior medial capsule release? This is a technique uh, taught to be my, my father KHSR and this is done in the figure of four position. You externally rotate <coughs> the leg as you can see here and that brings into view the posterior medial capsule which then you release gradually from the posterior medial surface of the tibia. Then you can do the pie crusting. The pie crusting is an important step and you've got to do it with 11 blade or a 16 needle. Do not make more than 8 or 9 punctures otherwise you might make the MCL incompetent. Superficial MCL is the last structure which I will release and as I told you off late I hardly release the superficial MCL. While doing it first you release the PES and then go superficially uh, subperiosteally all the way below. It will suffice to say that, that the anatomy of the superficial MCL, the superficial MCL is inserted about 8 centimeters uh, below the joint line and therefore you can release up to 6 or 7. Don't release more otherwise then you will make the MCL incompetent and then you've got to move to a higher constraint. 
So this is all about the release which we do in severe various deformities. Let us now talk a little bit about <laughs> the bone defects. You know, we have various sizes and shapes of bone defects ranging from less than 6 millimeters, more than 6 to 12 millimeters or sometimes even larger than 12 millimeters. So the, depending on this, we classify it as small, medium and the large defects. Also depending on the size of the defect, you know, it may be a content or the location of the defect may be peripheral or a composite defect and this also has a bearing on the management. If it is a contained defect, you can just use bone cement and that should be enough. But the peripheral and the composite defects require some kind of augmentation. So what are the various ways we can correct these bone defects? If it is a small defect, less than 5 millimeters, what you can usually do is just the cement and a screw. You know, that is usually enough. Or sometimes even the extra cement layer can be used for these smaller defects. Here you can see this is a contained defect and this is just filled with bone graft or even cement and this bone graft can be taken from the bone cuts which you do from the lower femur and upper tibia. So this is a defect which you can see a kind of a contained defect which also has a periphery intact. You put in a graft here and then go ahead and do the cementing. If it is a defect which is larger then you know you can do a step cut osteotomy and then reshape one of the grafts and see here as you can see these drawings are made by my father and then put and you know fix it uh, with a screw. As you can see here this is a bone defect which you can see and this is uh, not a contained defect. So you reshape the defect, put a bone graft and then you can fix it with a screw. Whenever there is a large bone defect as you can see here, you do a valgus stress x-ray, this is the kind of defect. Uh, which is seen and then this needs some severe reconstruction of the bone defects and you can see the bone defect on exposure. It is more than 50% of the condyle and a deep defect more than 9 to 10 millimeters. So in these cases of course you can use augments or you can use grafts and put it there and sometimes you can use allografts as well. But if you don't have access to bone bank or if you don't want to use augments I can show you another technique where you can do rectangular graft slot technique. So this is a press spread graft. What you do is you make a rectangular slot and this you put in the graft. This is again a technique you know uh, taught to me by my father and then you harvest the graft from the proximal tibial cut and the lower femoral cut and you pack it inside into that rectangular slot leaving it outside so as to cover the defect. At the base of the defect, you put in two to three screws so as to give it a cantilever effect and support those grafts. And this is how it looks post-op and the defect is, is, is completely uh, reconstructed. Metal wedges can be used and I have nothing against it but they are expensive and sometimes in order to fit in the defect, you have to cut more bone so as to have the exact shape of the uh, metal wedges which is available. So that is something the augments, the metal augments can be used. These are various types and we have now the tantalum uh, kind of aug augments and these have a good affinity to bone and heal up quite well. The only downside is the price. Here you can see another case, you can see the bone defect here and this was filled up uh, with a metal augment. What is important is whenever you are reconstructing the bone defects, of course you will do a good job but in these cases do not forget to add an extension rod. Now why do you add an extension rod? The reason is it will help you to bypass the effect and it will also help you to place the tibial component in the proper way because here it is important to make sure that you do not put your component in too much varus or valgus. So for me it helps me in two ways. First, it offloads the part of the board defect which is reconstructed and then second is also it helps me to uh, get the proper alignment of the tibial component. This is one last example which I want to show you, a severe varus deformity. You can see how much is the varus subluxation. Of course, this is partially correctable. This is the kind of bone defect which you see in this case. Then again, this is filled up with the rectangular slot technique 
along with screws to support it at the base. This is how it looks intra-op. And then if you've got your alignment right, and I told you I'm a mechanically uh, aligned guy, and if you have it right, and even if you have cement, which you put into the defect, the bone which you have there heals. Many people ask me that the cement will prevent healing, but I have yet to see a failure of my bone grafting technique whenever the component is put in the right alignment. For me, it is the mechanical alignment. This is one case, a severe varus deformity. This is now the last case. You can see the patient also had a pathological fracture here on the left side and a severe deformity on the right. So we here, we had to do a bilateral TKR. You can see here the bone defect. Again, the KHS rectangular sort press fit technique. We create that slot, put in the graft, slot it in. We have to add extension rod on both the sides. Here, you know, this is a pathological fracture. We were in the mind whether to add a plate here, but this did not require because the alignment was correct. And the fracture you can see here within two years went on to heal very well and the patient is happy and walking. So friends, I think it will suffice to say that whenever you are dealing with severe bone defects or severe virus deformities, you should be having a proper plan in place. For me, in these cases, I always use a PS design. Now we can talk about it in the question answer session. <laughs> which is superior. But for me, I always use a PS design whenever I'm dealing with severe parents deformity or for that matter, any severe deformity, especially also when I have to reconstruct bone defects. Second, I have talked to you about the various ways we can correct the bone defects. One of the ways to correct the bone defects is sometimes you can undersize the tibial component, shift it little laterally, remove the bone on the medial side. That way it reduces the bone defect and also helps to correct the virus deformity without doing much soft tissue release. So that is one technique which you can plan for correcting small to medium size bone defects on the medial side. And of course, be ready with constraint. I told you that whenever you reconstruct the medial bone defects, always use a long stem and that will help to offload. And whenever again you're using, uh, whenever you're doing a TKR for severe virus deformities, Keep a higher constraint processes like a TC3 or a LCCK as a backup because sometimes if you over release and make the MCL incompetent, we need to move to the higher level of constraint, which is either a TC3 or a LCCK. And very rarely, if you damage the MCL, you might require a hinge processes. So this is all I have to say for dealing with severe virus deformities and how to reconstruct a bone defect. I would like to end by thanking Dr. Deepak Dave, sir, Dr. Vikram Shah, who is the mentor for ISHK and my mentor too, Sharan Patil, President, Leo Secretary, Dhanashekar Raja, who is the Education Chair, and of course, last but not the least, the Bhishma Pita of ISHK, Pachore, sir. Thank you, everybody, for your kind attention. Yes, thanks, Parag. I think it was a very... Uh, illustrative demonstration of the common deformity before you read the questions yourself i have one questions uh, how many times you need to do the medial epicondylar osteotomy um, that's a, a great question severe deformity oh. off late i've hardly done it but in the initial stages i did a few cases whenever i have done all the releases i've released the superficial mcl and yet i'm not able to get it especially in a fixed virus deformity that is the time I would do a medial epicondylar osteotomy and then slide it below, fix it anteriorly or posteriorly, depending on what kind of deformity is there. Is it a fixed valgus, uh, fixed virus deformity with flexion or hyperextension? Sometimes in rheumatoids, you get hyperextension. Depending on that, I will place it, but not much. Compared to uh, a valgus knee where I have to do a lateral epicondylar osteotomy, my uh, you know, take is that I have done that much more often than a medial epicondylar osteotomy for a virus deformity. Is Dr. Vikram on? Vikram, uh, your comment on this? How often do you think we need the medial epicondylar osteotomy in a severe deformity? 
well to be part of all you know parag uh, gave a very lucid uh, account of uh, deformity as well as uh, bone loss uh, until last 7 8 years i had been doing pike crusting uh, which was described by ranawat sir uh, last 5 7 years i have never done it i tell you why see if you see if you do pie crusting actually you are in increasing the length actually if you superficial medial collateral ligament doesn't change with disease it doesn't get shortened so if you have to elongate it actually it is the lateral collateral which is elongated and you are going to compensate it so actually to correct the pathology you are doing another pathology so it's very important that we all understand that that superficial medial collateral ligament never get shortened number 1 number 2 there are two types of patients one heavy inflammatory tissue throwers and they are the patients who develop heavy flexion deformity while having varus and when you operate these patients what happens is a elongation of lateral collateral by 1 to 2 mm even up to 3 mm there is no problem you can leave it like that because this patient will be having enough fibrosis later on so there is no problem 10% of patient who are not heavy inflammatory tissue throwers with a good bone quality they elongate lateral collateral more because the bone quality is good on medial side varus is being produced by the expense of lateral collateral ligament and at that time if it is mild to moderate you might do pie crusting or if it is severe you do lateral epicondyle ophthalmy and tighten it so i really agree, agree with uh, you know whatever vikram bhai has said you know with experience you start you know releasing less and less and as he said he's hardly done any medial epicondylar osteotomy in the last 8 to 10 years or nor has released because one of the downsides of releasing is i'm telling you if it is overdone then that's a big big problem yes any and other one, yeah there's one question on the chair box is about the different type of stems so uh, i understand probably um is it a fluted stem or a uh, offset stem uh, what are the different type of stems we should keep in mind in the length of the stem that's the question somebody has asked yes so an excellent question again you know the fluted stems is just a type of design and sometimes you know what they advise is if you use a fluted stem uh, the post op pain is much less but you know that is a separate story so regarding the offset stems of course if your defect is such that you know you want to get the right alignment then you have to use a offset stem and especially in revisions i find that offset stems are very useful again there are two types of stems which i use the short stubby stems which then i fully cement or if i use a cement if i use a rod which is 100 mm then you know it has more of a diaphyseal fit and i just do uh, cementing in the metaphyseal area so these are the various types of steps uh, stems available short stubby which are fully cemented long stems where you just do hybrid cementing cementing is only done in the metaphyseal area do not do it in the diaphyseal area and the fluted stems is a stem which is available in certain companies and they claim that it reduces the post op pain is high bmi and obesity the main indication for your short cemented stems it's not the main indication but if you ask me what are my indications to add a stem then they are as follows number 1 is the bone defect if it is more than 25% of that particular condyle you know medial condyle or uh, uh, 50% of that condyle so 25% of the whole tibial surface number 1 number 2 you know if i want to add more constraint then i would use that number 3 in osteoporotic patients i would use it and number 4 in obese patients i have been using it but i really don't know how much value it adds 
because if the bone quality is good and you get your alignment right, then there is no real indication to add the stem. But I would be happy to hear Vikram by uh, your indications to use a stem on the tibial side. Same indications what you discussed. Nothing more. Okay. Yes. I think we discussed in one of the meeting and uh, he is not using the short cemented stem in obese patients. I think I asked a question to him in one of the meeting and he specifically said that yes. as you rightly said that um, whether there is any role or not but uh, probably the short cemented stem just for obesity no other indication so there is yes. no bone defect nothing then probably there is no role of a uh, uh, stem is that correct dr vikram yeah absolutely right hmm. absolutely right correct yes Dr. Pachore, anything you need to want to add? You are mute. Hey, I'm not. Dr. Pachore? I think uh, everything has been covered up. Everything has been covered up well. Oh. Um, another question, uh, Dr. Parag. Uh, yes. Depending on your tibial tray, whether it's COCR or titanium, does your screw uh, uh, metal uh, matters, whether SS screw or titanium screw, and whether the screw touch the base of the plate or they remain away from that? Yes. So it doesn't matter which screw you use, but the important thing what you said is there should be a cement mantle between the screw head uh, and the metal base plate. Uh, I would avoid uh, touching that screw head to the metal base plate because that can lead to corrosion and potentially uh, a chance for some wear debris which can again theoretically lead to uh, earlier uh, loosening. So uh, keep a nice mantle of cement there so that there is no contact of the screw head with the posterior, the inferior part of the metal base plate. Will anything Parag, uh, in this yes, screw placement? Radio lucent lines will be slightly more radio lucent line, but if they are non progressive, you should not worry. But do you yes. have some radio lucent line that one should keep in mind? That is the only one because the stress is different. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And as long as and this, keep the uh, screw, yeah, yeah, uh, keep the screws little more uh, vertical rather than horizontal. Even when you put a graph, don't put a horizontal screws because they are not under comp compression. You will have to put the screws little on the 60 degrees, but you can't do at 90 because there is no place. Otherwise, they will come out on the middle side. Absolutely. So, and all the graphs, they heal beautifully because uh, it is slightly different uh, biomechanics than what you are in the hips, you know. So, they yes. are better. Healing is much better in this rather than the hip. They don't heal that great well. Yes. So I just one more last question. We have a couple of minutes left, uh, Parag. Yes, um, sure. As you said sure. about the release we do do on the medial side, um, but in a subluxated knee, um, how often we have to do something to the popliteus tendon um, in a varus deformity? Can you just comment on that? Yes, so that's again a great question. Oops. One sec, yeah. So, what is important here to understand is that the popliteal structure should be uh, kept as a reserve, as the last structure to be released in various knees. And as you rightly said, if the knee is subluxated and you know you can see that uh, on your preoperative x rays, then you do all the releases. And if you can get a well balanced knee, then you need not go to the popliteus. But I have personally seen that the popliteus, because of the way it is attached on the tibial side, if you see the attachment from the femoral popliteal groove from the femoral side, lateral side, it goes down and the fibers attached on the medial surface of the tibia posteriorly. So definitely, therefore, if you release the popliteus, that subluxation gets corrected. And that's one of the last tools in my armamentarium to release a severe virus deformity. And I am not able to get a correction. So then I will release the popliteus as the last structure and I have seen that suddenly the knee corrects and you get a well-balanced knee. But do not do it routinely. I don't think it's necessary. It might be counterproductive. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I think uh, um, that's uh, uh, 
as dr pachor has said probably we have covered uh, almost all the uh, points pertaining to the uh, varus deformity soft tissue release and the bone defects so on behalf of uh, the trustee board uh, uh, myself and dr danashekar raja my colleague i thank dr vikram from joining from us and uh, dr pachore uh, dr pradeep and dr parag for sparing time and uh, be here on this educational program yes. so we thank you yes parag thank you sir i just wanted to you know take this opportunity before you close to invite everybody to pune this time in january 11 12 13 uh, we are having a historical meeting of a combination of the pkc along with the uh, roc so pune nikos is going to be dealing with arthroscopy and sports and uh, everything around the knee where we talk more on joint preservation and the roc will deal with the knee arthroplasty this time it is a more focused meeting on knee and i take this opportunity to uh, invite uh, everybody to attend this meeting vikram bhai pachore sir the way sir uh, all of you are invited and uh, please attend in large numbers i will personally communicate to you and invite you uh, officially but i would be happy that all of you attend and also dr pradeep you gave a excellent talk uh, this time is not going to be much hips but i take the opportunity to invite you also so thank you for allowing me to share my slide on roc pkc and uh, inviting all of you dhana you are roc fellow so anyway you have to be there sure sure <laughs> thank okay. you for this opportunity yeah Uh, yeah thank you everybody i think the next program is on 4th of november the first saturday uh, again as i said we will be communicating for one hip and one knee topic and please convey to your colleagues and fellows to join and uh, do not hesitate to write to us if you have some interesting topics to cover of course we are going to cover all the topics over the period of time as an educational program yeah. but please feel free to contact any one of us we are there to help for any suggestions guidance you need so i take opportunity and say good night to everybody thanks everyone and look forward to see you again on 4th of november thank you thank dr pachore dr sir. vikram dr danashekar raja thank, thank, you, you, thank you thank you thank you sir and good thank morning you. to vikram bhai have a good day thank you thank you everybody okay thanks
Thank you. 